Um, okay, so I should now be sharing the screen and um, you should be able to see the title uh, page of the PowerPoint. As James mentioned, it's I've decided to call uh, this talk The Many Lives of Greek Vases and cultural biography is um, a rather nice term, I think, um, in um, archaeology and art history, the cultural biography of objects, reminding ourselves that when we go to a museum and we see um, a very sort of passive, unmoving object stuck behind glass, so we can't touch it, we can't pick it up, um, and it gives a very static impression of that object, I think. And I think it's really important to kind of unpack the actual life history of these objects, to remember that they were handled, they were used, that they meant different things at different times. Um, and so that, that's really what um, I want to talk to you today about. Um, so you've got my email address here, it's ellen.adams at kcl.ac.uk. Um, if any questions come up, uh, come to you after the talk, then drop me an email and um, I will endeavour to um, answer your question uh, there. Okay, so many lives of Greek vases and um, I think um, another way of, of putting this maybe would be uh, different approaches to Greek vases. And I did this little brainstorm of um, how archaeologists and art historians kind of come towards Greek vases and what we hope to get from them. And I was very pleased actually to look at the syllabus that you have um, for A level and it, it does seem to have a sort of similar kind of logic and I think it's a really good thing to do to take a body of um, evidence, uh, in this case Greek vases, and to think okay we can um, explore their images, we can uh, think about how they were made, we can think about the artists, we can think about how they were displayed today in the museum, um, but what are the other uh, ways, what are all the different ways that we can um, come together and look at these objects? And you'll notice a slight tension here, I think, between archaeology and art history, and traditionally they are rather different disciplines. Um, archaeology is more about context, uh, more about uh, reconstructing the functions and using, in this case, uh, Greek vases for dating. And I'm going to start uh, talking about that. Whereas art history uh, usually, not always, but usually focuses on the image that may be on the pot and to extract uh, any meaning from that uh, image that it can. Um, so we've got just a, a little summary of uh, many of the ways I'm going to be approaching this topic. I'm going to start off with a slightly scary slide. Um, here we go. What's going on here? Uh, don't be alarmed. I will um, take a moment to um, explain what's happening. Um, I mentioned that archaeologists like to uh, use um, ceramics to help date their um, particular layers, their, their particular deposits that they are excavating. And this is really, really important. It may sound a bit boring um, or simple, but we need these, this information regarding date in order to use archaeology to write history. To get some sense of narrative, we need to have some sense of what happened when. And ceramics are brilliant for this. And they well, there's two main reasons for that. One of which is that they're very robust, and I've, I've got I've bought some uh, ceramics to kind of wave at you. Uh, they are very robust. This one here, the handle is broken, and I've mended it. But nonetheless, this is pretty indestructible after it's been fired, so they last very well. And the other thing with uh, ceramics, it's very common in a lot of cultures, is that fashions change with them. So the way in which they are made uh, changes quite quickly over time. So this creates a kind of list of uh, what uh, pots look like when. Think about, for example, how cars have changed over time. This is called typology. Uh, you've got that word here 
um, up on the slide. Typology is the different types of this class of evidence and how it uh, slightly changes over time. Ceramics change very quickly, so they offer a very good resolution for dating our deposit. And the diagnostic um, part of a, uh, a pot, the bits that are really good for this dating, include the uh, rim, the handle, and the base of our pots. And um, I'll, I'll have a, a, a word about that in just a moment. Um, so the two main images here, what, you, what you're looking at is a plan, and it's not a horizontal plan, so we're not looking up, down, we're looking at the side of a trench. You imagine an archaeologist, you're digging down, and uh, what you see are these stratigraphical layers, um, and stratigraphy um, is essentially the concept that um, when, when things are uh, deposited on the surface, uh, they gradually accumulate, they gradually build up. So if you're digging down, the earlier you go, the um, or the deeper you go, the earlier you go, the further back in time. On the left-hand side of the screen now, you've got very simplified uh, representation of this. This is from Arthur Evans's Palace of Minos, um, and it's very neat and tidy, straight lines across. You've got Neolithic at the, at the bottom, and then this is talking about the um, Bronze Age, they've got early Bronze Age, middle Bronze Age, late Bronze Age at the top, all lovely and neat. And uh, ceramics found in the individual deposits here will give, um, will kind of lend their authority to dating uh, these um, layers, if you like. Now, if you go to the bottom right, and there's a much more recent example of um, an excavation um, uh, plan uh, going into uh, the sort of side view of um, a, a trench. And it's very messy. It doesn't look the same at all, does it? And that's because um, archaeology is very messy. You dig down foundations um, into floors and it's all, um, it, it stirs everything up. You might have tree roots sort of growing and churning everything up and rabbits uh, building warrens and so on. Um, so you get a messy set of deposits. Um, you've got some flaws uh, depicted here, but here you see this Sheridan pot rule is breaking into this uh, floor and that um, deposit will be dated by the ceramics. Um, and what's very important in um, archaeological um, uh, reports, and I'm mentioning this because I, I suspect maybe you haven't looked at so many of these in uh, for your A level, but you will get depictions of pots uh, such as in the top right here. And it's been cut in half, and the left hand side is showing the decoration on the pot, and then the right hand side is showing um, the thickness of the rim, the, th the thickness of the um, body of the pot. And this, believe it or not, is itself diagnostic. It gives information to the archaeologist about when the pot was likely to be made, because uh, this changes over time as well. Some periods might be slightly thinner and some thicker and so on. It's very scientific. It's very, um, you know, you have to be incredibly well trained uh, to be able to recognise this sort of thing. And uh, this is quite hardcore archaeological approaches. Um, going to the next slide here. Why does this matter? Why, why bother uh, date deposits? We've got these lovely pots. What does it matter when it, when it comes from? And I think that um, any archaeologist or art historian or historian wants to create a narrative of the past and it wants to be you know pretty accurate so to get that you need to establish a sequence of events cause and effect it well it might help you think about cause and effect um you might want to um explore one particular region i'm going to be focusing on attica which is the area around athens and you might want to compare it with a different region like Berisha or um the area around Corinth. So you need to know what's happening at the same time 
in these different places, synchrony. And um, material culture, particularly pots, can be very good at helping us with that. And you may want to think about the duration of um, uh, phases as well. So um, if we're thinking about the archaic period in Athens, how long does that last? Does it last 100 years, 300 years, 1,000 years? Because all of the events and processes that we place in this phase, um, it, it kind of, it's important to know whether they were long drawn out um, events or actually, you know, really quite uh, um, uh, concise ones. So ceramics, um, I've been waving this uh, jug at you. Um, here's another uh, type of um, pot. It looks, it's a vase, it's obviously a modern vase. Um, and it's um, got some decoration here. These um, would possibly be very useful in helping with what's known as um, relative dating. So we can um, figure out if you're an expert that maybe this type of jug was popular um, after this type of vase. So we might find them in an archaeological deposit like this. So it gives you a sense of uh, relative dating. It's not so good for absolute dating. And this is what we use mainly today. So we're currently in 2021. Um, that's our year. And when we're doing history, if you know the exact date or even the exact time, that can be really important as well. And on the whole, um, ceramics aren't very good at this. Um, but I'll give you one modern um, exception. Um, and this is a cup that I bought uh, during the London 2012 Olympics. It's got the date written on the mug. So you can imagine an archaeologist getting very excited if they find this in um, the soil. Again, all of that was probably, possibly uh, not uh, what you're covering so much um, for A-level. And something else I want to do today is to think about the museum context as well. And um, I was interested that, that, you know, James was talking about um, if you want to prepare for university life, first thing to do is just immerse yourself um, in the material, be it literary, or historical or um, archaeological. And one thing I would add is once we're allowed um, to visit museums, um, your local museum or indeed the British Museum, if you can um, get to London. Um, and just spend time with the um, holdings that they have. Um, what you can see here is a plan of the British Museum. And what I've done in the left hand column is to pick out, to draw out all of the spaces that are given over to um, classical material in the broadest sense of the word. So including um, Etruscan material and things uh, from modern day Turkey as well. Um, and this hadn't even got the um, Egyptian material and so on. You can see that there is a large um, portion of space that's being handed over to um, the ancient world or the classical world here. And what's interesting to think about is how Greek vases pop up in many of these different spaces. And when they do, they're serving a different function. They're representing or they're illustrating a different point that the curators are making. And one thing I want to do today is just to run through some of these um, main points. Um, and again, I've got this term, I, I'm quite fond of it, cultural biography of object, so ancient artifacts, how have they been reinvented in uh, modern contexts? And museums is, is quite a, uh, a popular topic um, uh, here at King's. And you can imagine that uh, the archeologists amongst us uh, really want to do as much teaching in museums as possible. And we also do handling sessions um, as well in the British Museum, um, where we can actually get our hands on some original um, Greek vases and so on. And that's, that's um, great fun. Um, apologies for some of the uh, blurred photos that I'll be showing you. I haven't been able to go to the museum and um, uh, take clearer ones. Um, but here we have room 13 in the British Museum, and it's a space where you can see uh, sculptures, you can see gems, you can see uh, gold jewellery, um, and you can also see lots and lots of lovely pots. Um, you'll notice 
that many of these pots are complete. And one thing that the archaeologist again will be very interested about this material is where exactly was it found? I don't just mean the region or even just the site, but the actual deposit. And many of these pots, if you look at them, are remarkably complete. And that's a good indication that it was probably found in a burial. It's probably a grave good because if you think about it, you've got a burial, uh, you place the uh, corpse in it, you've got lots of grave goods, and then you seal all of that and you leave it as a mark of respect. So this is brilliant for preserving the grave goods as well. And if you imagine a, a settlement um, and it's been destroyed or it's been abandoned and it's gradually falling apart, uh, these objects are going to end up smashed. Uh, the shirts are going to sort of be quite widely dispersed and they're going to get weathered by the elements as well. So you're going to lose uh, a lot of that um, lovely decoration. Um, and if you can see, I don't, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but looking at the top right image of a series of pots, and if you look at the centre, there's one in the middle which has a large amount of... Um, plain monochromic um, um, surface and this is a modern mend because that um, uh, that has not survived so we haven't been able to uh, add it. So thinking about deposit uh, context of the um, disposition uh, deposition is important as well. Uh, if we pass over here to the image on the left we have the Sokolos vase and this is one of your um, kind of case studies if you're looking at Greek vases and you'll notice that it's got a case all for itself um, and it means that you can walk all the way around it and you can get as close as possible uh, to this object and that's an indication of its importance. Uh, the museum recognises that this is a really uh, important object that it's very lucky to have. Uh, let's have a closer look at this um, object, the Sophilus vase, so called because there's an actual inscription uh, running between the columns of um, uh, Pelias's house that says um, Sophilus um, painted me. So we've got the name of the painter. Uh, this is a Dinos, so it's a mixing bowl. It's, um, it would be used to mix wine with water. And you can see that it's, you know, form follows function a lot with vases. Uh, it's got a, it's a very open shape. We call this an open shape. This shape here is more closed. It's not completely closed, but if you're going to transport or store or, um, a liquid, then this would be a lot better because it's easier to um, close it up at the top there. Um, this here that I'm, I'm waving a, a jug at you, this is good for pouring because you've got this um, lip at the top, it makes it all nice and neat. Uh, whereas the um, cup that I uh, waved at you before, this is um, obviously very good for drinking. So um, one thing to, you know, uh, remember to note when you're talking about vases is what they were actually used for, what's their function. So this is a um, mixing bowl. You'd have used it to uh, mix your wine and water, but it's also beautifully decorated. So this had a really important function of being a talking point as well. You'd have that set in the middle of your party and, you know, you've got, you know, if, if, if everything runs a bit uh, uh, quiet, you've got a very good um, talking point to kick things off again. So you've got this wonderful stand that the um, the um, uh, main bowl is um, placed on and there's several different friezes uh, running right around uh, this image. You've got some uh, wonderful exotic animals, uh, you've got fabulous creatures, made up creatures um, and at the top uh, you've got uh, a scene of the wedding of uh, Peleus and Thetis, and these are the parents of Achilles from uh, the Trojan War uh, stories, um, of course. Um, here we've got a little close-up of um, the um, procession. So basically, people are, you've got Peleus on the um, far right here. Uh, behind him is the inscription explaining that Sophilos made me. And then coming up to him 
uh, you've got all sorts of gods and goddesses and uh, semi-heroes uh, coming to enjoy the um, party. Here, for example, is Dionysus, and we know it's Dionysus because the painter's very helpfully uh, written its name here. Um, but it is very common in Greek art for um, figures to be given attributes. And by that word, I mean signs and symbols that indicate the identity of that particular um, figure. Um, so uh, here we've got a close up. This is a, a rather, uh, it's a group of lesser known characters where you've got Athena and Artemis on the far right. I'm sure many of you would have heard of them. Um, and then we've got the family of Thetis, who is um, um, a nymph, um, semi-divine, so marrying a mortal, that was um, uh, controversial. Um, and uh, you've got this, this, this wonderful sea creature here with um, a fish, uh, fishy um, tail. So, um, you know, that kind of gives the game away of who that is. Um, I want to do a close up to stop, to pause and think about uh, the black figure technique. Um, and I'm sure you're all learning about um, black figure versus red figure. Um, and just a reminder of um, the differences between the two. Black figure is first. Um, and basically what happens is uh, you've got the ready clay of the um, um, attic vase. This is just the nature of the uh, composition of the clay from that region. It gives this wonderful orangey ready um, colour. And you, the, the idea is that the painter would paint the figures with this slip um, that after firing um, uh, turns black. So to get the actual decoration on this, you want to scrape the slip off and that reveals the natural colour of the clay underneath. And that's why um, it's got wonderful detail on this vase, but the lines here, if you look around the hair of this uh, fishy creature, the, the Oceanos, um, it is quite sharply done. I mean, they've literally sort of chiseled uh, the decoration there. It's not very subtle. And another uh, thing to note about black figure is the common use of added paint, further added paint, especially, for example, um, having white skin uh, for the women here. And this is a colour coding which is very common in um, ancient art. The Egyptians did it as well. The reasoning is that women were inside, so quite literally, sort of stuck inside all day, so never had a tan, whereas uh, men would be outside hunting and uh, exercising and competing uh, and doing um, all of these events, so they would end up with um, a, a, a big tan. Um, okay, so I've mentioned that the Sokolos vase is a, um, a a mixing vase, mixing wine and water. Uh, so this would be a, an important object for the symposium, the drink, the Greek drinking party. Um, so this is a um, male um, um, occasion um, and it would have been, um, you know, you could talk business, but the main function I think we can safely say is to uh, mix lots of wine uh, with lots of water and uh, drink as much as possible and also eat um, and so on. Um, we're now looking at a case in room 69 in the British Museum and this is the Greek and Roman life room um, and it's a great room. I mean the previous room we were in, um, room 13, um, does uh, works very hard to set out the chronological and regional um, variation within the ancient Greek world. This room takes a more thematic approach. Um, it does both Greece and uh, Rome and or the Romans and it takes each case is a different theme. So if you want an overall impression of these cultures then this is the space to go to. There are lots of Greek vases used here and here um, you've got um, Greek vases that would have been used in the symposium illustrating this particular event. And I've got a close up of one from the British Museum 
uh, which again, this is, you know, a nice example of how art seems to reflect life. So this image here can give us a sense of what the symposia would have looked like. Um, so what you can see in front of you are three men um, and they are reclining on their couches. This is how um, uh, Greek people would have uh, been eating. So, you know, this is how they would uh, enjoy their dinners. And uh, the one on the right um, is a very interesting perspective because we're looking at him from behind. And I think the uh, painter is probably feeling quite pleased with himself for managing this perspe um, perspective. Um, the figure in the middle seems to be the leading guy, possibly the host. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, he's got this um, uh, wreath in his hair and he's holding out his kylix. Oh, go back a bit. He's holding out this kylix and he seems to be asking for uh, more wine. So the um, boy is approaching him, holding a jug in hand. Um, and so he's obviously mixed the wine with water in the crater or dinos or uh, whatever is being used and he's bringing it over and he's about to um, uh, pour it uh, for the um, uh, man there. And you can also see lots of pots decorating the wall, they're hanging on the wall there as well. So this is a really nice example of how um, uh, art can tell us something about social life in the past. And one other thing you may notice here is that this is a red figure kylix. And a kylix is a drinking cup. Um, this is looking at the outside of it. So if you tipped it over, you would see the inside. Um, and being red figure, that means that the background is actually uh, painted in, it's filled in, leaving the natural clay for the figures and that's why they end up looking red and this means that you can paint the detail on the red figure so you get rather more subtle um, result as probably why they decided to flip to uh, this in about uh, 530 520 BC painters started experimenting with this red figure um, style in Attica. Okay, we're back in room 13 and I wanted to show you this uh, because what you're looking at here is a, um, is a um, case filled with um, attic vases. And what you can't see over to the left is a case of Corinthian vases and um, other areas of Greece as well. So this is aiming to show visitors the regionalism within uh, the Greek world as well. And that's something it's really quite important to remember. It's not all about Athens. I think we get a bit uh, carried away by the um, material from Athens. And I'm guilty of that, I think, in this um, talk. Now, what I want to focus on um, in the next slide is, and again, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but uh, two objects in the top right there. Um, and uh, the, you can just see them off screen there, but here is a, um, a better view. And um, I, I, I apologize again for the unfortunate uh, blurriness of all of these um, uh, photos. I, I haven't been able to uh, refresh them and produce better ones. But this is um, a really good example of the power of museums to say quite a lot by just placing two objects side by side, juxtaposing them as you have here. So uh, what we have on the right hand side is a black Bukuro amphora from uh, uh, Utruria. Um, this is a part of modern day Italy. And this shape is local to that part of the world. Um, and what the shape is doing, it's an amphora that Shea certainly had in Greece as well, but this amphora is deliberately imitating a metal vase. And um, if you look at the handles, for example, can you see that they are flat? Uh, and normally on vases, you get sort of rounded handles. It's actually nicer to uh, pick up as well. Uh, but these are handled, uh, these are sort of made flat because this is what a, a bronze um, object would uh, look like, for example, you, you'd hammer it flat, 
bend it round and that would form your handles. And also the ridges that you see running around the body of the pot, uh, this is where you might imagine um, joins being made between uh, different parts of uh, the pot. So it's imitating a metal vase. The metal vases were much more prestigious than uh, the ceramic ones. And what you see on the right is a vase that's clearly imitating this shape, but it was made in Athens, it's made in Attica. So the potter here is making a vase for an export market. It's not, you know, gonna make a nice vase and then put it in the shop window. Uh, it's got a commission or it's just gonna send out um, a, um, a, a sort of collection of objects and hope that it gets uh, picked up in Etruria. Um, and if you look at the labels in the British Museum, you will see that an awful lot of them that come from Etruria, come from modern day Italy. So it, it, it does intrigue me rather that when we're sort of looking at Greek vases, we're actually looking at Italian, modern day Italian uh, material culture. Uh, and the reason for this in the British Museum in particular, and obviously different museums have different histories, is because um, of uh, this guy here, William Hamilton, who lived in the 18th century, period of the uh, Enlightenment, and room one in the British Museum is all about this period. It's all about um, uh, the 18th century, which is when the British Museum was founded. If you go to room one, you can see this um, uh, display of Greek vases, all very symmetrical, uh, very easy on the eye. And this is how uh, vases were um, uh, displayed in that time. You've got a portrait here by Joshua Reynolds uh, that you can see in the National Portrait Gallery. And the reason why uh, the British Museum has so many vases from this part of the world is because Hamilton sold his collection to the British Museum in 1772. And it, it still forms the uh, kind of heart of the collection. Why was he in Italy? Well, he was the ambassador uh, the British ambassador, and he was based in Naples, which is, you know, close to many of the excavations he was making. I say excavations, that's probably uh, a generous uh, term. Um, this is not archaeology as uh, we would understand it uh, today. This is very early days of scientific archaeology, and this, what you see here, is more like uh, tomb robbing, really. It's um, basically just cracking over the tomb and going straight for the grave goods and not uh, making a proper record of the uh, skeleton and all of the other important archaeological evidence as well. Um, so here you can see Hamilton overseeing uh, one of these um, tomb openings. This would not be allowed today and uh, the ethics of uh, um, uh, sort of building up these um, big collections of ancient artifacts is something that we're, we'll come back to in a moment. Um, still thinking of function, so we've done, um, you know, the symposium um, and we, we sort of looked at some uh, burials. Um, this is a, a lovely collection of objects. I couldn't not mention the white ground uh, lucky souls. They're so uh, gorgeous, I think. And they're made specifically for the burial context um, because the, they're called white ram because they've been painted white um, and then a, a lovely um, painting put on top of it. This is not very robust um, and uh, if you do a handling session in the British Museum you're not allowed to touch these because uh, they're just too fragile. They're not very good for everyday wear and tear but great for depositing in um, a burial. And here you have several scenes. Again, we have this idea of art reflecting life, uh, scenes that we can imagine act actually happening in the ancient world. Uh, so for example, on the left, you've got the court um, being tended to by um, a couple of women. Um, they were generally in charge of uh, treating the dead. A bit of myth uh, in the uh, middle one, we've been taken over the river Styx. And then again, back to real life in the far white, white one as well. 
Um, actually, one thing I did want to say about this is that these are um, especially important because um, wall paintings haven't survived very well from the ancient world, from the ancient Greek world anyway. So these give us a little insight into what we're missing there as well. Very important objects. Um, so let's have a quick look at a reminder of what we've looked at. We sort of looked at dating, glossed over technique. Uh, been looking at various different um, archaeological contexts and functions um, and also mentioned a bit of iconography as well and of course the importance of the artist. Um, another function that I would like to mention is uh, the ritual sphere and here we have um, a a, a case again from room 69 in the British Museum. This is talking about the Panathenaic Festival. Um, so this is uh, something that you may be aware of um, from your studies, but this is like a big festival done in uh, Athens and the rest of Attica, celebrating a patron god or goddess, who of course is Athena. And there were lots of um, competitions in uh, this festival. And the prize that you got was one of these vases um, or Panathenaic Amphora as their name. Uh, you can see one on the far left and the far right um, of this case. And this has been filled with olive oil. So really quite a, a, a serious uh, prize to get. And normally you would get the activity that was the uh, competition on one side and then a picture of Athena on the other. So this is uh, a reminder that, that ceramics were made for the ritual sphere as well. Um, and what's interesting about uh, the uh, Panathenaic um, vases actually, is you, see, you can see here that they're uh, in, oh, sorry, they're in a uh, black figure here. And even when other vases crossed over to red figure, uh, the Athenians still made their Panathenaic vases using the black figure technique. It's like the tradition of uh, making your vases in this way was felt to be um, something that, that, you know, you just had to stick with. And, you know, it, it was somehow jinx the ritual if you uh, swapped over to the other type. So there's a, the power of tradition in material culture is uh, visible quite a lot of the time. And of course, it's something that if you're using these objects for dating, you have to uh, bear in mind as well. There's a close up again um, of some of these prizes. You can see on the left, for example, there's a foot race uh, uh, that this would have been the prize for. In the same space, um, I've been talking a little bit about. Um, the uh, how art can sometimes uh, reflect um, life um, and an awful lot of these pots you get images of myths as well and this particular space this room is uh, very good on that so if you're interested in the labors of Pericles uh, you can look at lots of pots that um, illustrate different myths um, so for example the bottom left um, I'm, I'm a I think, yeah, that, that must be the Nemean uh, lion, uh, for example. And likewise, in the same space, um, you, there's various different episodes from the Trojan War. Um, and this is some, something that sometimes art historians like to do, to kind of take the material visual culture and the literary culture and to sort of see how they uh, overlap, sometimes contradict one another, um, they're just sort of different media for uh, looking at the same uh, myth. Okay, and then and then we are in a different function altogether. And here we have a, a, a lovely, um, absolutely gorgeous piece from the British Museum, uh, which is tiny. It's under seven centimetres high. And um, it is um, that the mouth of this uh, beast, it's, uh, it's a wonderful piece, I think. It's sort of uh, equal scary, equal cute, if that's possible. Uh, some sort of lion, and you would pour your liquid um, from the mouth of this lion. It's a very small object, so you might imagine that what's inside it is very valuable. Indeed it was, it would have been used for perfumed oil. 
Um, so being part of your toiletry. Um, fully made in Corinth. Um, so, oh, yeah, was made in Corinth and um, has that particular Corinthian um, orientalizing um, look from the mid seventh century BC. And it also seems to be depicting in the main frieze um, hoplite warfare with the round shields. Um, the, the ranks being broken somewhat here. You've got some people have fallen on the ground, um, but the idea is that formation is very close um, uh, so that you protect one another. So you've got this little object and what, uh, what I've done here is to um, bring some modern um, equivalent um, objects uh, just to show you. Uh, so here you can see a, um, a, a modern, unfortunately all the perfume, you can still smell it, but all the perfume's gone, so you sort of dab it on you here. And I wanted to show you these because, um, let's see if this actually works. If you look at the decoration, um, there's something really rather classical uh, looking at this. And I've got several of these objects. Here's another one here. Um, if you can just see uh, that um, in, I'm holding it up to the camera. Um, and uh, these all have a classical look to them. They're all um, sort of semi-nude. They, they've all got sort of a limited amount of clothing, uh, wreaths in their hair. And the dress that they do have is, is sort of um, the, the, the frilly um, uh, dress that we might expect from the ancient world. Um, so this is just a reminder that uh, of the influence that the ancient world has had in um, our ceramics um, as well. Um, I'm showing you this because um, we're thinking about how you display these objects. And you imagine you know, you've, got, you've got someone who's sat there and they're dabbing their perfume. Uh, they're actually using this object. And the modern context is so utterly different because it's behind glass. Um, so you're, you know, you're at some distance from it already. And in fact, the museum have provided this um, uh, magnifying glass so that you can see the detail of the uh, pot. Uh, well, because, you know, you're, you're in this kind of um, uh, alien environment, but, you know, it's, it's, this is an object that's meant to be handled and we're just not allowed to. So um, they're having to think about how to get around that one. Um, OK, um, we're coming towards the end. I did want to end on um, what does it all mean for us? You know, um, how has Greek, how have Greek vases influenced the modern world? And um, in some cases, I've just shown you um, um, slightly kitsch example of that, but here um, is a is a very well known example of a direct uh, copycat approach. Um, on the left hand side, you see the Portland vase, which is in the British Museum, and then on the right hand side, a direct copy made by uh, Wedgwood, which you can see in the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, so this is something you know the influence on more recent artists. Um, is, is really very substantial. And my final example is this piece here, the um, uh, Euphonious uh, vase or million dollar vase, as it's known. It's the first vase ever to be sold for a million dollars. And this in itself is astonishing. But when you think that this was way back in the 1970s, when a million dollars was worth an awful lot more than it is now, that's even more incredible. And it's, it's a reminder that these objects in the ancient world wouldn't have been that expensive at all. I mean, some of them are beautifully decorated and uh, certainly, um, you know, the, 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 the poorer people would not have had something as uh, smart as this vase. But if you were really elite in the ancient world, you would have had metal vases. You'd have had um, bronze or silver or even gold. So. The, they, they, they weren't actually, you know, that prestigious. It's interesting that our value has really inflated the original value of these objects. So it's made by Euphonius, one of the pioneers um, who was experimenting with foreshortening and um, representing the human body as accurately as possible. And it's a very experimental period, so they didn't always get it right. Uh, so, for example, the shoulder of uh, Sarpedon, uh, who's uh, dead here, um, doesn't look quite right, does it? That's not how the body would collapse over uh, like that. It's not how the shoulder would look. 
Uh, but the fact that the paint is having a good go at uh, depicting this is in itself, uh, you know, was uh, commended in the past and is still today. Um, so here we've got Hermes in the middle and he's got some attributes, his special cap, his wand, his uh, winged um, uh, um, slippers. Um, and you've got death and sleep who are taking this uh, body away. And even if you didn't have their names written on um, the pot, you could probably figure out who's who from their attributes. Um, now, this is an interesting vase because the uh, Metropolitan um, Museum in uh, New York purchased it in the early uh, 1970s. Uh, four million dollars and they were very pleased to have this object but then there was a hotly contested court case about whether the object had been looted and the crucial date here is 1970. UNESCO this is part of the United Na Nations so it's a global uh, body passed this convention uh, that made it a lot more difficult for people to casually purchase um, objects from other parts of the world. It's a real attempt to crack down on um, the um, um, market in um, ancient um, antiquities. Um, each independent um, nation then had to ratify it, but the idea was that this was a global agreement. And the Met bought this object after this had been passed. Um, because objects from before it gave a kind of amnesty um, that it was widely recognised that you couldn't undo everything that happened. So this was, you know, starting from a clean slate. There was a court case and it was found that this object was very likely to have been looted. So it was repatriated. And you may assume that it was sent back to Greece, but no, it was repatriated to Italy because this is where it was found, um, it, this is where it was looted from. Uh, so this is, you know, an interesting reminder that um, ownership of the past um, is all about where objects were deposited, not where they were made. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, quite interesting how modern nation states don't really map very well um, onto um, ancient entities. A little summary here of the many lives of Greek vases. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm almost to time. Um, and um, all of the different ways in which I've kind of um, uh, wanted to think about this, this single um, body of material, but lots of different ways um, of thinking about it. Um, archaeological or um, art history, different tensions, different approaches and different information that we can extract um, from these objects. A little reminder of my um, email there, if should you want to um, uh, uh, get back to me, 